and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. My name is Mildred the Monk, I am your one and only gaming monk, and with me, of course, is the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. And what? And we can sit. We can safely say that when we when when we say we don't like something, we don't fall. We don't fall back onto it when it's merrily con when it's merrily convenient in the name of def of defending certain groups. Yes. <laughs> so. <sighs> it is. <laughs> It is Thor's day. Um, we are a few out. We are a few hours away from the start of April Fool's Day, i.e., the one day of the year that everybody at my that everybody at my place of work looks at me sideways. The one day of the year that it, that everybody looks at me sideways because they know if I uh, if they even remotely try to prank me, well, um, I give better than I get. The thing is, I don't, I don't even have to. I don't even have to. Um, you know that you know the expression "one sword keeps another in the sheath." Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's how that's how it's become, where my reputation has just gotten to such a level that people are guarding themselves for getting pranked, even if I don't. I mean, mine's not to that level, but that's only because I like encouraging a little bit of madness, aka mutually assured destruction. I'm like, go ahead, make my millennia. Mm -hmm. And with the, but even even with that, it I'm probably gonna have another repeat of what of what happened with the donuts where. Um, somebody else, br somebody else brings in donuts. Everybody thinks I did it, and I end up walking away with freebies because everybody thought it would be a trap. The best jokes are the ones we don't tell. <laughs> so somehow I, once again, somehow I managed to prank my colleagues without doing anything. But we are not here to discuss. We are not here to discuss April Fool's pranks. Even though I, even though I seem to be one with one with a talent for them. No, we're just here to discuss a nearly April Fool. Pretty much, an alternate title I was considering for this discussing episode is "Shadversity and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Week." And I do want to make something clear. I don't, I don't hate Shadversity. In fact, I, I I like a fair amount of his work, and I do and I do have a fair amount of respect for him. I know it may seem like I'm like I'm picking on him after how harsh I was on Cogent, but I don't even think I was that harsh. I mean, it is a, it was one of your unimpression series, and you yeah. tend not to go too hard on something that's still in alpha. So, no, it wasn't really that harsh, all things considered. No. I how however I wanted to address them direct I wanted to address them directly on the matter because if there if if there was going to be any harshness to come it was their own damn fault because of the fact that they talked a big game. Mhm. Mm that was that was the real problem they had. They were talking all that they were talking a whole lot of crap about um about the whole e the whole easy to learn but still but still has depth. As if the, as if I'm um, back in 2003. Yeah, they were uh, writing checks with their mouths that their ass couldn't cash, mm -hmm. or at least can't cash at this moment. But you may have given them the ability to do so. Yeah, and I'm fairly certain that that some of the things that I criticized have been handled by homebrew, mm -hmm. but. I don't. I didn't give Palladium any any slack for people picking things up with homebrew. I don't give um, Bethesda any slack for that. 
and I'm not giving them any slack for it. Homebrew is a spice, as we usually say. Mm -hmm. Can't use it as a stopgap. Yeah. But I want to... But... I will, ad I will admit that, some that um, something that holds me back from watching a fair amount of people who are, at the very least, adjacent to HEMA has been a degree of elitism. And to that end, I think it's, it's important to, re to remark on the difference between an expert and someone who claims to be in a given field. Now, there are a lot of things that define the two, but the one I want to focus on is that an actual expert is willing to admit what they don't know. Or if, they, or if the data that they have for something is, for one reason or another, incomplete. Now, exactly. I, I know some might say, but Shadversity isn't an, isn't an, isn't an expert, aside, aside from having, having successful novel work. That is technically true, but speaking from my own experience... When you end up accruing and demonstrating a level of knowledge that is on a non-standard level, no matter what you think, people are going to be looking at you as if you're an expert. Especially considering all the videos he's done showing actual HEMA forms or uh, the quote-unquote proper ways to use medieval weaponry on his channel. And because and because of that, because of that, it's something. It, people are going to bring him up in the same way that I've seen. Pe I've seen people bring up um, techs in regard in regards to battle tech. Even though Tex himself doesn't think of himself as an expert, he thinks of himself as just like as just some guy. Well, I mean, if we're if we're being fair, up until the Exodus, monk. Just about everyone in the Battletech community who was in it on the regular uh, only thinks of themselves as just some guy, even though they all have a non-standard understanding of Battletech, since Battletech itself is niche. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. And the and it's the I um in the process of in the process of doing this discussion. I ended up coming up with a bit of a t with a bit of a term. That is the. It is a it is a trap. And God damn it, I can't. I completely forgot the way I phrased it at, before we went live. The transferability pitfall. I do remember it. Yeah. Because I helped. Now the transferability <laughs> pitfall is. The assumption that being an expert in one thing is automatically going to be transferable to a different field or specialization within that within that field, even if it's in the same field that you're an expert in. I'd liken it to treating treating someone who is a great actor as if they can play any role that you put them in. Or a great actor thinks they can be a great director. Which, there are some that can do it. And there are many who cannot. I know it'd be tempting to bring up Affleck, but he's the exception that almost proves the rule. Because <laughs> for every one Affleck, you've got two dozen with so's. Okay, that's a little bit unfair. That is a little bit unfair. We don't, we don't know if Wiseau was either a professional actor or a professional director before the room. <laughs> or professional anything, but for that matter, but he is a professional wise man. I'm gonna tell you right now, and I mean wise man as in wise guy. <clears throat> he he is definitely a professional troll. Yeah, but I. But when it comes to when it comes to expertise. It is it is important to not get too big of a head on on the matter and and think that you are and think that you are automatically correct on things. 
And this is where we get to the first of this little two-part affair. So, I'd like you to set the stage regarding the animations incident. Since this is how uh, the thing first came to my attention. Yes. So, a little over two weekends ago, so not this previous weekend, but the weekend before, and just a tiny bit before that, uh, Shadowversity released videos regarding Elden Ring and some animation quote-unquote gaffes he saw with the weaponry in the game. His claim was that the way certain weapon types in the game work is not at all how they would actually work using actual combat forms historically shown, and that this is bad and should be corrected, not realizing that it's intentional, especially since many of the weapon fighting styles within Elden Ring are transplanted from all the way back in Demon Souls, just polished up through iteration. Mm -hmm. um, I actually personally confronted on him on this with a, with a comment on his first video and stated that, because uh, he had specifically pointed out that the weapon movements for the rapier, the scimitar, the katana all in the game, were remarkably like what you would see in Hema. But that movesets for weapons like the great swords, or the colossal weapons, or the pole arms, were all vastly incorrect. And I am saying incorrect, uh, because that's what he's thinking. Because they they have these large, unwieldy patterns to them. And so when I confronted him, I said, well, that's not for lack of, of uh, you know, th th they don't have any lack of, of resources to reach out and get that type of, get that type of animation. They don't want it. They don't want it because it doesn't fit the vision of the game, which is that all of these weapons have to have a certain a certain advantage and a certain drawback. Because not only are these weapons PvE, they are also PvP for invasions. You're going to be fighting other players, so the weapon sets all have to have a certain amount of balance to them. You, either you use these bigger, heavier weapons that have these ponderous, slow, unwieldy animations that are, uh, if you're baited out, you're done. You are done. Uh, but if you can learn to use them properly, can become a death trap for other players and for other NPCs during PvE. Or you can trade that off for a lighter, easier, more maneuverable weapon, something that might be a little more well-rounded, but isn't really specialized. And I pointed out how this is all about the ethos behind the gamification. This is a video game. There's an interactive element, and there's going to be a sense of need for that sort of balance. He disagreed. He said they probably just didn't have the reference footage for the animations because look at how well they did the rapier the scimitar the katana and so when he pointed it out again in an actual response comment i responded well yes sure they got the movements of the rapier the scimitar and the katana correctly but even at maximum dexterity which i specifically went and respect for to test the the katana the rapier, the scimitar, all swing slightly slower than what you would expect from someone trained to use those weapons in real life. Me having been part of the SCA and done heavy stick fighting and a little bit of HEMA myself, I know how fast I can swing a fucking katana, and it's pretty fucking fast. <laughs> I also pointed out to him that maybe if he were talking about Demon Souls, he'd have been correct about not having the money for the references. But this is 
the fifth or sixth Soulsborn, if you count Sekiro. Uh, and th this was also a huge budget. Massive. You knew it was going to be massive as soon as they said they managed to get a celebrity writer, George R.R. R. Martin, to help with the world building. I'm pretty sure he took the job because it meant, it meant that he could distract himself from actually finishing his story and putting out the winds of winter. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he took it just so he could say he was writing and troll people. I'm, at this point, I'm convinced George R.R. R. Martin is a troll. There's no end to the Song of Ice and Fire, and uh, he's just going to die without telling anybody that. Yeah, and un unfortunately, uh, nobody's going to nobody's going to pull a Sanderson and finish his story. Sanderson might, if we ask him nicely enough. <laughs> if, I'm being, <laughs> if I'm being honest, I don't think I don't think Sanderson has any interest in the kind of story that George Martin wants to tell. This is true, especially Sanderson. Because, um. Tolkien is still living rent-free in George Martin's head. This is also true. But this entire thing... First, he had the... Uh, this, this first video that I was commenting on was him trying to set up a project where other HEMA enthusiasts in his community could submit videos of themselves as references for weapon packages. And then he would submit that to FromSoft... He then made a second video I didn't bother watching because I was already done with this issue. Um, specifically trying to counter people saying, well, no, the, the weapons are designed that way for game reasons. And trying to discount that argument as if, oh, you could still have the same game balance with these faster movements. Not realizing that if that were the case, Rumsoft would have already done it. And this is why I want to qualify the fact that I don't have anything against FromSoft. And I'm going I'm going to call back to a article I remember reading a long time ago when the when the late Roger Ebert made that remark about video games can never be art. And yes, he eventually walked that back, but that didn't happen quite yet when this article had dropped. And the the article in question had stated in a paraphrased form, if you don't mind. You are a, you are a film critic. You are not a game critic. You know very little about games beyond the, beyond the occasional cross-media thing that even most gamers and game critics don't care for. Mm-hmm. Is even though there's been better ones since, keep in mind this was mid 2000s. The only good cross media stuff happening in video games at that time is dot hack. Well, I'm more referring to game adaptations of films. <laughs> and well, in that situation, the amount of good examples you could list off on one hand, you know, st stuff like NES Batman or Sp or Spider-Man Two or the Two Towers. Mm -hmm. Not exactly batting a thousand there. Nope. Monk, I'd, I'd like to make a quick correction to something you said before going into Roger Ebert. Mm -hmm. You said, and this is why I'd like to say I, I don't have anything negative about FromSoft. You meant Chad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was my bad on that front. Sometimes my brain acts faster than my mouth. It's all good. I just figured I should step that in there before we got too far. Yeah, but the but the the reason I bring that up with Ebert is to parallel the fact that I'm not entirely sure how much Chad is aware of the particularities of game development, and this is not me saying that he needs to be a game developer. I am I am certainly not a video game developer myself, but I know enough to know that. Game development is not too far removed from a watch made by a watchmaker. A lot of gears, a lot of a lot of moving parts, all wound tight and all in a very precarious balance. And if one of those gears is not aligned properly, 
the whole watch doesn't work. And even FromSoft is not immune to this. Even Elden Ring is not immune to this. Uh, to point out specifically, we first had the very first noticeable thing for all PC gamers, the micro stutter issue. Or for some people who had lower spec systems, the macro stutter issue. Mm -hmm. Which was corrected with a patch. Uh, on top of that, some of the weapon scaling just wasn't working. That was fixed with another patch. There are things still being discovered by the, uh, the community now. One of them being that the way attack registers work with different sized enemies of the same type causes the smaller sized enemies to be able to hit you for longer and thus cause way more damage and bleed. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, the bleed dogs doing 11,000 damage when they're the tiny v version. Uh, and a modder has even said this is an extremely simple fix that should be able to be fixed in a hot patch. And the reason the community does this is not because they're trying to tear at FromSoft. They're trying to help them. The guy who found the original remote code exploit in, in Dark Souls and was doing it on, on stream to bring it to FromSoft's attention because he hadn't been able to get through to them with two separate emails... He was not doing it to fuck with FromSoft. He was doing it so FromSoft would fix it. And they did for Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. If you, if any of you are still playing Dark Souls, you'll notice the servers are still down. And that's because they're fixing they're trying to fix it there, but it's of a lesser concern because Elden Ring is the big thing they're supporting right now. And for and obvious and reasons. And for better or worse, has a lar has a larger install base. A much larger install base. Oh my god. Even with the fall-off, it's still bigger than all three Dark Souls games on PC combined. Which, as a, um, as a quick aside, it is funny that that um, certain people high on Copium were trying to argue that because of the fallout that the game was dead. Um, putting aside the fact that this is, pr that this is primarily a single-player and not a multiplayer affair, so a large player drop off does not in, does not indicate death. Yeah, it could just be people playing offline cuz they don't want to encounter invaders. Mm -hmm. But uh but even like you said, it's a, it's a tightly wound, precisely made watch and even from soft still has to go in and replace parts because they're not all precisely set. And the big example, the big example that I always use regarding how just a tiny change can have massive, can have massive implications. Consider the sprint debate in Halo, and I know some might go, "Why are you bringing up Halo in a conversation about animations?" It's to demonstrate. It's to demonstrate this cascading effect. Well, I mean, sprint is an animation change, so... <laughs> technically speaking, yes. No, it, not even technically speaking. Like, mechanically speaking, you are moving faster. Your animation is also changed to fit that faster movement. Oh. Um, the... Sp the... Now, uh, some people say, why is sprint so controversial? Shouldn't Spartans be allowed to run? The issue is... You are giving, you are effectively giving a player two different movement speeds, and that of that affects everything else in terms of the in terms of the map, in terms of how, in terms of how they potentially take damage, in terms of how they're going to be get, how they're going to be getting around and what ha, what hazards they have to account for, as well as the as well as the fact that. You ha you have to you have to account for um, flow. One of the big one of the big reasons I'm not a big fan of sp of sprint mechanics in shooters is the is the is the stop start mentality of it. It's also the reason I'm not a big fan of a reliance on ADS because because I I prefer that constant movement instead of a stop 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 and start for aiming and moving at as as separate entities 
But that one little, but that one little change once again affects so much, so many other things. And the same, the same applies when it comes to tr when it comes to trying to change these these sorts of animations. There is one particular flaw that I'm not entirely I'm not entirely sure if um, Chad had considered this regarding his little project. You're having people film the, you're having people film themselves possibly from one angle with each of these animations. If you think that's going to be sufficient, then I've got a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. If I remember correctly, he did ask people to get as many angles of the same maneuvers as possible. That's still a bit of an ask for lay people who probably don't have that level of camera experience or even that many cameras to do that. Well, I mean, if even if they only have one camera, they can just change the angle, do it again, change the angle, do it again. If you want, if he wants to have an assload amount of videos set, sent to him and f and fill up a cloud storage in the process. Well, be my guest. But even even with that, something that something that I don't think I don't think he considers is I think he's op I think he was operating under the assumption that they were using mocap, and I don't know for certain if From Software has used mocap with their animations. They probably used mocap libraries, like common use libraries that are probably around in the actual industry. But I don't know if they used on at home mo mocap. No, and when it comes to mocap, I know I know a lot of people like to sing the praises of utilizing mocap. But I remember when there was an interview around the time Eco had come had come out on the PS2, and. One would think that the animations in that were done with mocap, but they actually weren't. And the reason given by the director was that it is that mocap makes things too realistic. So instead, they animated by hand. Mm-hmm. And um, that brings me that brings me to something else when it comes to the, when it comes to this animation thing. Then the reason why I said that. He's he's think he's thinking it he's thinking in terms of this romanticized idea of verisimilitude and not in a game that people want to play. Any decision that you make for a game should be in the pursuit of that game's goals or the betterment of that game's goals. The question that I end up ended up having is Suppose that these animations were implemented. How exactly does that make the gameplay better? That's a, that's a very good question. That's a question that wasn't answered. He just thinks that they need to look more comparable, I guess. Because he, like I said, he made a second video where he allegedly... You could still, uh, you could still um, have just as balanced a game with these new animations. Well, for one, you for one, you don't, this isn't a, this isn't a issue of balance. Oh, I know <laughs> it doesn't really add anything to the game. Yeah, and if if anything, it's ta it's taking away work that it that could be, be that could be better spent in other places. Um, I liken it to when Dr. Disrespect decided to be a fucking idiot by claiming that well if they added a BR if they added a BR why why would why would you guys be so upset about it you you wouldn't have to play it putting aside the fact that adding that mode out of the gate to Halo Infinite would be time taken away from other modes that people would actually want that people might actually want to play yeah, and in that same vein, going going that kind of hog wild into animations would end up taking a lot more time than it's really worth. Than it's really worth. And I've seen we've seen plenty of examples of games that try to go all in on 
on that sort of visual fidelity, and it ends up cre it ends up creating more problems simply because of the power draw that that it, that those animations need. But moreover, and this is the reason why I asked what be what benefit what benefit this would serve. I think he's forget he's forgetting the fact that if he wanted a game that has that level of verisimilitude, why is he why focus on on open on these kind of open world games? Because the other names that he focused on, it wasn't just Elden Ring, even though that's the big one he focused on, but also games like Skyrim, Breath of the Wild, and Dragon's Dogma. Games that have multiple avenues to their combat. And I think he also focused on The Witcher as well. Which I found hilarious, considering The Witcher does not tout itself as having verisimilitude. None of the ga none of the games that he's focused on um, tout that. There are games that arguably could build themselves on some degree of verisimilitude, but these are entries like Bushido Blade, Hellas Court, and Blade Symphony. Games where wep games where weapon animations are far more crucial, and typically are done in a man-to-man -man setup, not. Man and any and any sort of monster, especially since a lot of the monsters that you're dealing with are many times your size in mm -hmm. a lot of these kind of games. Yeah, um, I, I I'd actually like to point out that beyond soldier-like characters in the Soul series, in the Soul series, and in Elden Ring specifically, um, or monk characters, most of the things you fight are monstrosities. Even if you were using real Hema, Hema was created was with fighting other humans in mind. You are not going to use the same moves to kill a human that you would use to kill a 30-ton fallen star beast from an asteroid that's the size of a fucking double-decker bus. The other thing, to, the other thing to consider is that even any time, any time the animations might be considered accurate, I'd say that I'd say that that would be a more incidental thing, rather that rather than something more con more um done by design. Yeah, it's just what worked best for that weapon set. Plus, the other the other. Th the other thing that he, that is not being considered is there are, there are times w there are times where you have to make concessions for the purposes of game design not balance but design there is the common myth that two-handed weapons are slow and ponderous when you look at two, you look at say Zweihander or Claymore forms, and they can be significantly faster than people would think, and and um even hand and a half forms are faster than a lot of people would think based on their depiction in video games, Kinjutsu yeah. especially. Well, I mean, it, but I think with people thinking Kenjutsu and Katanas, they already think fast because they're they're depicted as pretty fast in most fiction. Um, but the, the big thing about large two-handed weapons that I don't think most people think of when they look at them is inertia. Mm -hmm. You are using the mass of that weapon as part of your movement. That's how you continue the flow. That's how you can be as fast as you can with weapons like that. Mm -hmm. So... That's why some of the Claymore forms are deceptively fast. All the more so when you've been when you've been when when you have a type of soldier who's who's bulked up to compensate. Yeah, most most people who 
uh, wielded big two-handed weapons like that, whether they were large war hammers or large pole arms or, again, large swords, um, tended to be pretty strong already because guys wielding that were also usually wearing more armor than the other dudes around them. Mm -hmm. So you got a guy who's wielding 100 kilos of stuff on him if he's even in just half plate and has his Vihander or yeah. a Claymore. And the other... One other thing that I distinctly remember talking with you about when this whole thing started to go down is an amusing comparison, because you know how much I love contrast, mm -hmm. between he, between a fair amount of hematubers that I've seen and a fair amount of gun tubers that we've seen. Where where the gun tubers look at guns in fictional media and go, well, that's not right at all, and then just keep going. Yeah. But I mean, how many... But Now, Shadversity is, is certainly guilty of this. I'd say the biggest person who's guilty of this is Skullagrim, who I'm not as kind to. I don't watch Skullagrim anymore. No. Oh. He got... He... he, he... <laughs> Every time I watched any of his videos, I felt like I was being condescended to. I, I don't know if that's just the way he intonates or what. It's a distinct possibility. And more recently, he decided to do a video on 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 um gun blades. Plus, plus the the video that always stuck in my craw with him was the t was the time that he um. Tried to see about the practicality about the of the weapon triangle in Fire Emblem. It's a it's a fucking video game. It's a fucking video game. The weapon triangle is there to balance mechanics, you shit. I remember when I was in high school, I made a game called Legend Wars that had a that had its own initiative triangle but that I referred to as sword, gun, and magic. That was a mm -hmm. glorified rock, paper, scissors thing of who would go first. Mm -hmm. For the record, nobody's going to see the rules for Legend Wars. I've kept that stored in the vault. He locked it away because he's embarrassed. I locked it away because it's shit. See, he's embarrassed. Fuck you. <laughs> but that was but uh, that was not me trying to I was not trying to do realism with that. I was tr I was trying to introduce a gameplay mechanic to make people to make people think about the order in which in which they declare certain units to attack. That's the reason why I th I um I look at Shad's view on this on uh, this kind of thing and Skull's view on this kind of thing as very as very narrow because they're think they're thinking in terms of a Hema expert or something similar which I don't disrespect them for but they're not thinking of this in terms of a game designer mm -hmm. because. Why? Well, let's let's use the weapon triangle thing. Now, obviously, we do, obviously we don't have a direct line with intelligent systems, but what purpose does the weapon triangle exist for in Fire Emblem? An ability, the ability to establish a tactical advantage with the with the assortment of units that you have. You you place the units that have the better advantage on the on the triangle around units that are disadvantageous to their type so that you can kill them faster and get get the objective, whether that's kill everybody or get to a certain point on the map, uh, I, with less risk. Because mm -hmm. um, up until very, very recently, permadeath was not something you could turn off in Fire Emblem. You'd lose characters if you weren't careful. Especially in some of the more infamous ones. Looking at you, Thrasia. Mm. The other thing is... Um, all weapons, even the ba most basic weapons, have uses, and then they break. They they cannot be they cannot be restored. So killing things in the least uses of your of your consumable weapon materials as possible 
was preferable. Yeah. Now, with that, now with that in with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes to the weapon design in Elden Ring, and with and within the Souls within the Soulsborne games in general, what it is trying to teach you is utilizing the different weapon types and how they scale with your attributes to develop a particular to de develop a particular fighting style to survive against what's coming. Not only that, um, because of the variety, there is a play style that will likely resonate with you. With that type of variety in play, you can experiment, find what feels best to you and go with it. And while a lot of while a lot of weapon styles will be will be will have will be on some end of the pendulum between strength and dexterity, there's still a wide amount of middle of middle ground between all of that. Mm -hmm. And each of the and each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. And of course, if we're if we're going to be talking about this sort of animation animation verisimilitude. Um, it's a little convenient that he didn't bring up magic. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to talk about total verisimilitude, we may as well bring that up. A thing that doesn't exist in our world at all. Mm -hmm. I... I get the feeling that he wants his interest elsewhere to be expressed in his interest in a video game. Which, to, to me, that veers a little bit too close to the to the representation claptrap that we, that you and I cringe at every every time somebody talks it up. It's I will admit it's 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 definitely uh, tangential to that, but this isn't like oh there's there's. A woman in this game. Oh, there's an African American in this game. Oh, there's there's a Hispanic in this game. Oh, oh, there's an Asian in this game. Well, yeah, it's Reg a Japanese game. Regard the reason why I draw the parallel is the idea of seeing trying to see val trying to see validation in outside material. Yeah. To try to try and to to try and um do popularity by osmosis. Yeah. When the fact of the matter is. No matter what happens, HEMA and things that are HEMA adjacent are always going to be an extremely niche matter. And I think that's I think that's the reason why certain HEMA folk I don't get along with because of the inferiority complex that I see from them. It's a combination. They're they they they've got a complex about not a lot of people acknowledging their expertise, acknowledging their knowledge, but at the same time they've got a kind of superiority complex going on about how they're they're the ones who have this knowledge and nobody else does. It's that combination. Mm -hmm. And. I I remember I remember seeing a, I remember seeing a lot of people in nums um, in one Hema form that was that get really really butt hurt anytime anyone bring up ma bring up manga bring up what the fuck am I saying anytime anyone brought up manga they would get really butt hurt on the matter and I remember and of course there's also the story that you had told where apparently if you're a knight you're only supposed to use sword and board and nothing else. When I was in the SCA, the only way you could get knighted in my kingdom, uh, Kalantir, or, yeah, Kalantirs? I don't remember the fucking kingdom names anymore. I haven't paid my dues or cared about them for a while. Um, was to master three martial forms and take your oaths as a knight, etc., etc. One of your martial forms had to be weapon and board, or no, no knight would see you as a knight, period. 
because he had to get vetted by other knights. They were all hidebound and, and pff, frankly, too sucked up in their own knighthood to, to be good knights. They did not like the fact that I went on a, a heavy stick large, uh, grand melee, you know, 50 to 70 people, with two Zweihander and wrecked shit. 34 confirmed kills. That was didn't half the... Didn't you also get in trouble for... For using a for using a spear like as a total weapon instead of using it to just stand and poke. Yes, yes, actually, that one was in a later war between my uh, particular Skadian band of of Rittersnacht against a a different Skadian band of Rittersnacht over some perceived slight between our captains. Um, I took a nine foot spear and instead of you know marching forward in lockstep and poking with it, I swept people's feet out. I stabbed them on the ground. I whipped it around like you would see guys do with you know spears in kung fu because that's actually a really good way to use a fucking spear. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at one point, the uh, the marshals, the field marshals. Uh, called me over and said, you, you can't keep doing that. I'm like, and why not? They didn't have a good answer. So they just kicked me out of the battle. Yeah, and the reason the, the reason why I bring this why I bring this kind of thing up is to establish that pattern of a of a narrow view about things. And even even if those even if those animations were implemented, which I do think it, I do think it was a bit arrogant to to um, presume be, presume himself as some sort of savior of, fr of from software that he somehow knew better. Mm -hmm. Um. How how much of a return would you get from that kind of investment? Because the only people who the, who those proper animations would satiate are the are the Mavera similitude people, which is a minority of a minority of a minority of a minority. Not only is it a minority of a minority, et, et cetera, ad nauseum, um, uh, probably for those uh Mavera similitude people 95% of them have already purchased Elden Ring which if you did if you did that to the animations now you'd end up pissing off more people <laughs> because it means everybody else has to now relearn all of the, all of the patterns that they had gotten used to up until that point exactly i'd liken it to and i know don't bring don't bring up the Ambidexterity, but ima imagine being told, "Okay, now you got to catch with your right hand," as after you've been left after you've been left-handed catching f for most of your career in s in say um, baseball. I I can't relate. <laughs> I know I know you can't rel I know you can't relate, but I've s but I suppose a better example is when I've seen pe when I've seen um. I've seen players in football or baseball try and try and get and well not try to but end up being told that they have to play a different position. Mm -hmm. Like I've I've seen my fair share of stories of somebody who was a quarterback in college get into the pros and to, and be told, "Okay, you're playing tackle now." Wait, what? The complete fucking opposite of what he's been doing up until that point. Yep. Spoiler warning, they tend to not do all that well. You're trained for a position, and you're asked to work in another position you were never trained for. That's essentially what, what, what this boils down to. There are some people who have a degree of versatility where they can do multiple positions, but they are rare, rare unicorns. They're rare, and usually it's due to an interest in multiple positions to begin with, so they've already kind of familiarized themselves. Or, the, or they're somebody like Jackson and are able to... Someone like Jackson or Sanders and able to do two sports at the same time. Mm -hmm. Those are the rarest of unicorns. But the uh, 
I think the animation argument is uh, the lesser of his crimes in this in this yeah, regard, though. Mike. That w- that's just the appetizer. <laughs> then, we yeah. get, then, we get to, then we get to the bigger um, main course of the thing. Now, first now, off, I um, before, I, I hate to use the I hate to use this phrase because because of how it's been overused. But on some level, one could argue that this is a bit of punching down. But before, but let's get into the setting of the stage. So before we get much further, I do need to set a little bit of a timeline. The first video, the one that I had the co- the little comment back and forth with Shad, happened Friday, not last Friday, the Friday before. Mm-hmm. The the second video about the the animations and how you could still have a balanced game with animations, uh, with these new animations, happened two days later. And the third video that starts the real big issue happened two days after that. Mm-hmm. So, it looked like all was quiet on the Western Front, to use a cliched phrase that I actually love very much. Um. Until a new video dropped, I saw Elden Ring in the title. I'm like, oh no, not this stuff again. And I look at it, and it's not about the animations. Oh no, it's much worse. Yeah, it's an you... hour-long video I didn't even bother watching. I believe the title was What Pisses Me Off About Elden Ring. And then in parentheses, World Building and Story. And this is this is where this is a an even more bla- blatant case of of a na- of a narrow view. And this is I'd say this is really where the um the the expertise tra- the expertise um pitfall that we t- that we talked about or that we talked about the transferability pitfall that we talked about earlier really mm-hmm. comes into play. Mm-hmm. Because so, oh, go go ahead. Yeah, because he takes an hour to waffle on about the same points for one. At least the way I, the way I understand it from the really good summary re- response to him that uh, we both watched. We'll get to that. Hmm. But the point boils down to. The game doesn't point out enough of the story to invest me. Which And that's bad. He, if this if this was a if this was a story written in the way a novel is written. He may have had a point. However, I th- I think we, I think we've lear- I think we've learned with especially with some of the various experimental ways stories are told over the last thirty years mm-hmm. that that particular model is not a universal one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be like saying that you have to tell a story in chronological order, and yet one could easily point to Pulp Fiction, for example, which has a, an asynchronous story. That begins technically in medias res. Yeah, if I have to use a video game example, Hotline Miami 2. Yeah. And uh, the 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 big thing here is that there are games, video games that have stories, stories that are told in a sequential way, and even help guide you to where the story is. And they work perfectly well. Um, fantastic game that came out recently that did it really, really well. Tales of Arise. Mm -hmm. It's a large game. It's an action RPG. It's very, very challenging in some places. But it does its best to keep you on track with the large world building and story it wants to give you. It is a little bit catered, sure. But it feels good. It suits what the game is trying to to complete and to to present. Yeah. Whereas the 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 reason that we bring that kind of thing up is that kind that kind of story that kind of novel like story is not a story that Elden Ring is interested in telling the kind of story that it's interested in te- in telling 
is one, the type of story that doesn't transfer well outside of video games. And two, I would say is I would say is far more akin to the to the way the way story is conveyed in some survive in some survival horror games. Mm. And so, and um some of Ken some of Ken Levine's output. Yeah. Where you are piecing what happened in the if you look at if you look at what happens in the active story in say Bioshock. There's not a lot that there's not a lot that really happens. But what happens is given further weight as you go along by see, by seeing what happened before you came along. Yep, with the things like the audio logs and looking on the different parts of Rapture and finding the stuff about all the the experimentation and plasmids and such. Yes. Mm -hmm. You fill in the context. Although I would say its story is still a little more guided. The context pieces do require going outside of that guidance. I suppose a better example in that regard would be um would be would be System Shock 2. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you want to complete the story? Uh go do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> go do stuff. What do you mean, go do stuff? Go do stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I find the story. Go do stuff. <laughs> oh man, System Shock Two pissed off so many people. Yeah, and now one might argue. One might argue. Doesn't isn't that veering into the handbreaking thing that I bitch about so much? It can, but it's not exclusive to that. Handbreaking is what happened when the go do stuff is done in such a poor manner that you that you need foreknowledge and that's not a, that's not the only way that handbreaking can manifest the key the key thing that it that um that I feel I feel like some that something like Elden Ring and subsequently that's that particular storytelling style is is trying to is trying to emulate is but is by presenting a is by presenting a sandbox a sandbox that definitely has an all roads lead to Rome situation but the there's way more than one can, road yeah there are there are virtually unlimited roads to Rome mm hmm and this isn't unique to Elden Ring either. This is how it's worked through all the Soulsborne games, mm -hmm. uh, except for maybe Sekiro. Again, Sekiro. The reason I say if you count Sekiro is because it is such a different experience. Yeah, and if if I'm being honest, when um when Sekiro first got announced, I was the one person who was calling people out when they were comparing it to Souls games, and I said that I've you'd be probably bet be better served comparing it to Tenchu. Now granted that was an incorrect assessment on my part as well, but that was the vibe I was getting from those early demonstrations. Well, and the director even said he drew a little bit of inspiration from Tenchu, so <clears throat> plus um Tenchu's Tenchu is one of my favorite stealth games. Yeah, it's a good game. And it's funny that we talked about the whole UI thing in the past because the closest thing that you have to detection when it comes to Tenchu is the key thing, and calling yeah. that levels of detection is a little bit generous. That is a, here's a general idea about how screwed you are. Mm -hmm. But we digress. Yeah. The, this storytelling, uh, this particular storytelling method not only treats your character as a vehicle for story, not only treats the enemies as a vehicle for story, not only treats the NPCs as a vehicle for story, the entire world is a vehicle for story. Everything from the details about the environments you're in, to the item descriptions, to random signs found in the world, to the motivations of certain bosses 
is all part of the storytelling. And it's up to you to take this jumbled jigsaw puzzle, which you may not even have all the pieces to, and put together some semblance of a picture. I remember Miyazaki talking about this, talking about how when he was a kid, he would re he would um, find these books and have no idea how to read what was in them, but he still kept trying to understand what was in them. Yep. I'm vastly paraphrasing what he said on the matter, but that played a factor into how he approaches this style of storytelling. And that's also the reason why people have been able to do so well for themselves by interpreting and trying to put the pieces together. I know I bring him up a lot, but I always find myself coming back to Ralph Coster's book, A Theory of Fun, mm -hmm. and his remark about how people derive fun from the act of overcoming obstacles and being rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. Say what say what you wish on the matter. The the whole the whole lo, the whole lore videos and lore discussion videos that people put up up to and including the prepare to cry videos that Vati does a phenomenal job of, and I know it's only a matter of time before he does a few of those on Elden Ring. He's he's done a couple now. I'll have I'll have to check his channel because I hadn't seen it yet. The last the last time I checked, it was mostly listing off secrets. Yeah, he um, I think he's I don't think he's done anything lore related yet. I'm not sure. No, but I know that it's coming. Of course. And I know some. I know some people roll their eyes about the dis about the discussion of lore in sto in storytelling. However, it is a it is a vital piece to establishing a living world, a world that is not that is not just a backdrop or a movie lot set. But one that, f but one that feels like it is on some level alive. Because saying that you need to find the Elden Ring to in order to s in order to save the lands between, that alone is not going to be all that interesting of a story. It but also tells you nearly nothing. Mm -hmm. Or, li or, in the case of Dark Souls, linking the first flame. Or in the case of Demon Souls, that you're trying to put you're trying to put the old one back to sleep. Tells you nearly nothing, but it gives you almost this this itch in your brain. Like, what's the old one? Why am I putting him to sleep? What's the first flame? And what does linking it mean? Mm -hmm. What's the Elden Ring? And why do I have to become Elden Lord to do anything with it? And I would I would say that, but even if you, even if you went through the strictest thing without doing any without doing without putting any pieces together, by the time you get to the end, you've got a far bigger sense of the of the greater context oh, yeah. to everything that happened beforehand. Oh yeah, um, it has been confirmed, in fact, that to even advance to the end of the game. You do have to beat two of the other uh, Shardbearer bosses to get into the Holy Capital mm -hmm. to advance to the Erd Tree. So you you have to go defeat these people, which means you're going to get context just from the fight alone and the cutscenes dedicated therein. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. It also... Well... You know, I guess I guess a bit. I guess a one of my fi one of my favorite examples of this whole brink of this whole greater context thing is the is one of the bigger tragedies 
within the within the first Dark Souls. That that being the fall of the Abyss Walker. Yeah. Now on on the surface, when you when you meet him, you you could just approach him as as any as any old boss fight, but as you get further on, and especially after you meet Sif, that's when it doesn't take long to put two and two together and re and realize that what you had fought. What you had fought when you fought, uh, when you fought Autorius, was so, was somebody who was supposed to be the hero of the story, but had no, but did not fully grasp what he was fighting against, and it consumed him. And even even as even after he fell, he was still fighting against it. Yep. Reminds me a lot of Radon in that way. And obviously, that is a vast, vast simplification of the matter. To go into Artorius alone would take us hours, uh, like it did Vati. So, yeah, no. <laughs> but we, we're there's... not the lore dump channel. <laughs> no. And while I've while I've considered doing lore videos on Legend of the Five Rings, um. I'm not quite pre I'm not quite prepared for that just yet, and even when even when I do that, um, the first thing the first thing I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get clear is the differences between the clans before I even get before I even get into certain individuals like um like Dai like Daigotsu for instance. Yeah. Or th or. The Steel Chrysanthemum, a.k.a. Rokugan's version of Caligula. <laughs> but we're digressing again, Monk. The point that the point that I want to get at with this is that he is he you, is that he is kind of approaching the storytelling in bad faith. Because he's approaching the storytelling in the way that you would approach the storytelling in a linear novel, one that doesn't involve multiple, one that doesn't involve the juggling of multiple characters, or even one that does. Which I could go, I could go on about how I'm not, I'm kind of mixed on a lot of fantasy novels hand, trying to do multiple perspectives at once, but that's a story for another night. Looking at you, Wheel of Time. Oh, we'll get. Oh, we'll get to that one of these days. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, but I've I've mentioned in the past that I resent the notion of design by gospel. This idea that you ha that if you're doing a certain game, you have to use mechanics a certain way. Not because they're a good idea, but because that's the way they've been done in the past. Design by gospel can apply just as much to writing as it can to game design. And that's the reason why I say it's a bad faith thing, because he's applying a standard that Elden Ring, and by, and by extension, the majority of the Souls series, as well as Sekiro, is not interested in. Yep. I am um, now. I I did point this out when we discussed it prior. I don't think he's doing so out of maliciousness. No, this is this is a case where Hanlon's razor applies. Mm -hmm. Never count. <laughs> never never attribute to malice what you can to stupidity. I think that he's coming from. He's using what he knows. That being a of a very traditional manner of fantasy writing, and applying it to this game yeah, as a lens, yeah. Which the pro the problem is is that f well for one, um, trying to trying to use a outside framework for lack of a better term on anything is a bad way is a bad way to assess matters. It's something that I've I've seen other reviewers do when it comes to tabletop games, and it's something I try and actively avoid 
as best I can. You know, th thinking about it, um, and about one of the lines that uh, Zeo Storm pointed out in his video that we'll eventually get to, um, there was actually a really poignant, really poignant, uh, I guess, um, argument that Shad was trying to make. He said, when I got to, you know, the lake region, uh, I never would have known to go to Raya Lucaria, uh, you know, other than seeing that it's a big castle in the distance. And I thought, yeah, maybe I'll go there. Um, and he instead wanted, like, Melina to pop up in a cutscene uh, once you get to Lyernia of the Lakes, to the new region, and inform you about some of the mysteries that, that might need to be solved and some of the conflicts you might run into and points of interest. And that's it just came... A Yubi bo that's a Yubi box kind of thing. But there's a psychology behind it that I just came up with, like, a name for that I don't know if it already has a name, but this is my name for it. Passive curiosity. His curiosity is is one where it's the same type of curiosity you see while reading most, or while you see most people reading novels. They're reading the events, and they're told about some stuff, and they're like, oh, I wonder how that'll piece together later. But they never, like, pour over it and single it out. Um, whereas people like you and I who are intensely and blindingly curious, I swear to God, um, it, our curiosity is a very active part of our experience in almost anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're there digging. We want to know. And because we want to know, coming into this beautiful, almost idyllic lake area, seeing a giant castle that looks a little off in the distance we go what the fuck is happening there why the hell is there a castle there but there's like nobody around what's going on and that like hones us into the fucking castle hones us into the academy of raya lucaria and we're just like i need to go there i need to find out what happened what the fuck is going on when it comes to that um curiosity thing i'd like mm -hmm. to bring up i'd like to bring up a point of comparison with a project that we've dipped into in the past. Mm -hmm. That being the um, sk the skilled house in Agito Arcanum. Yeah. In fact, I'd, ar I'd argue you can put it, you can put a degree of this active curiosity in all four houses with Agito of course. Arcanum. They just express it differently. You couldn't be an adventurer without that sort of um, intense curiosity. Mm -hmm. People who do not have an active and intense curiosity will not seek adventure. They will be content with what they have, and they'll wonder what if, but that's really it. And when it comes to that contentment, I'm reminded of how in first in the first edition books for The One Ring, and I'm, I haven't double checked to see if th to see if this is still the case with second edition because although I have the books, I haven't poured into them in detail yet. Mm -hmm. So many plates, so little time. Yeah. <laughs> the, there, there is talk. There is talk of advent of adventures being possessed of a wanderlust, and ju and just and that the player characters within the One Ring are people who. Have have that degree of wanderlust to go to go outside of the, to go outside of the comforts of their homes for one reason or another. It doesn't matter what that reason is. The fact of the matter is that they're going they're going outside civilization. Yeah, they're leaving comfort, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is weird to most normal people. Yeah. As and, as it is intended to be, because because adventurers are not supposed to be normal people, and in 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 a lot of the in a lot of the Souls games, even if even if you're not that whole, even if you're not doing that whole leaving the comforts, you are still you are still someone who is not normal. You uh, <laughs> compared to other. Uh, 
well, hollows slash tarnished, etc. Uh, yeah, you're definitely not normal. Um, if you look at the, most of the other undead in the game that aren't the NPCs you interact with, and even most of the NPCs you do interact with, in Dark Souls 1, they're despondent, they're feral, and they're uh, listless. And in Demon Souls, you are you're essentially an adventure. You're essentially some sort of adventurer coming into coming into the place. Yep. Probably probably lured lured by the promise of what's of what souls can bring in the in the same way that um forty niners were were lured by the promise of gold during the during the gold rush. Yep. <laughs> And then, of course, in Bloodborne, you're a hunter. Mm -hmm. And, like, at this point, to be a hunter is to be one thing. To try and put down the taint before it gets you too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. you have... It says at the start, seek pale blood to transcend the hunt. Exactly. Um, so you have to go out there and adventure to make sure you yourself do not become as Father Gascon did, or Gascoigne, or I don't remember how to pronounce his name. I always go with Gascoigne, and yeah. it's very telling that he's the first boss you end up fighting in Bloodborne proper. A, mm -hmm. a kind of kind of a sign, kind of a way to say, if you, do, if, if you don't transcend the hunt, this is what will happen to you. Yep. It is a cautionary tale, an Aesop. Mm -hmm. And um, with the Tarnished, they're all called. All of them are called by the grace of gold. Whether they perceive that grace for long or not is immaterial. But the, it's literally, you were spurned from this land long, long ago, or your ancestors were. Now return, become Elden Lord. You you literally, your curiosity is the little golden lines you see coming out of the little golden flames on the ground. Mm -hmm. But the the whole thing about it is, even compared to other tarnished, um, even Vare implies you're one of the few left that still sees not just the grace of gold, but the guidance of gold. You are special for whatever reason, even though you are, as the intro puts it, a tarnished of no renown. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of this need for a very active curiosity, I feel his comparison was was to revert to what is comfortable for him. Which, if you're, if I'm being honest, is the wrong way to approach us to approach any kind of medium. Mm -hmm. I suppose at this point, though, this uh, this brings us to after that third video, mm -hmm. a uh, a mad lad who we both subscribed to because of this video. <laughs> responded to Shad about how some of the points he made in his hour-long video, which Zeo Storm knocked down to a 12-minute summary <laughs> with counter-arguments. The whole thing was 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, put, took, took the main points from Shad's arguments and said, well, here's how those ideas aren't aren't relevant or correct to how you're applying them. Yeah. And so I will note something that Zeo Storm opened up with was that his chief his chief concern was the ripple effect of somebody with that large of a internet footprint making claims that are so, that are so blatantly false. Mm -hmm. And as somebody yeah, who's, he... who's had to endure people um 
repeating Spoonie's talking points about Final Fantasy VIII when it's very clear they never played, or the or the tabletop WoW argument that I get to this day regarding D and D Fourth Edition. I can understand that position. Uh huh. But I do appreciate the fact that Zeo Storm took a one-hour video and and condensed it to a t to a twelve-minute response. And he made a lot of points that we've kind that we've kind of covered. the fa the fact that he the fact that he was uh, he was approaching in questionable faith, as well as the fact that he's a that his quote unquote fixes were essentially to turn Elden Ring into a more novel like story. Mm -hmm. And And at this point, uh after he after he does this video, Shad actually responds to it. Which I found amusing because you've got Shad who's got like what, two million subs? Nearly, I think. Whereas Maybe over. Zeo Storm only's got about twenty thousand. Uh, Shad's got one point three. One point three one point three million. Okay. Whereas Zeo Storm I think had like twenty to twenty four thousand at the at the time. Uh I think so. He's at 25 right now. Yeah, which is certainly no slouch, but of all the of all the videos that 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 were po that were made on the matter and all the responses he chooses this one. Well, and what's really bad is he his response is paragraphs literal paragraphs on it. when i took a screenshot of it for you when i first saw it um i i had to full screen my his it was a my browser essay. let's not dance around it yeah i had to full screen on a 40 inch tv to be able to screenshot the entire thing in one go it and nowhere in zeo's uh, response video was he accusatory or um, combative in the tone with which he responded. And he yet just that said was, he... that was the um, that was the pattern with Shad's res with Shad's text response on the matter. At least that's kind of what it read like. But of course, mm -hmm. text not having tone con context is harder to read. He did. Bring, I will give. He did bring up a claim of being taken and being taken out of context slash in bad faith multiple times yes he did um he, i mean he did the very beginning to quote you begin this video by wanting to not misrepresent what i'm saying so i appreciate your intent but unfortunately it doesn't take long for you to misrepresent one of my points because you say that people are not supposed to know everything in the game <clears throat> But and many of his responses are like that. A hey, thanks for civil response, but here's why you're wrong. Which, whenever I whenever I he, when whenever I hear the whole th thanks for civil response, but here but here's why you're wrong. And I'm not I'm not impl I'm not implying that this is the case, but there's always something that feels so disingenuous about it. I guess. Yeah. Um, there's actually a part I specifically do want to point out. Chad, in his response, on, on this written response on this video, says, At nine minutes, you completely miss my point and just confirm everything I was saying, but then blame me for not, quote, taking the time to explore and not finding it, end quote. If it's so easy to miss essential plot points to even understand or appreciate what's going on, it's a flawed storytelling method, which you're con only confirming. What... Zio says at nine minutes. He's talking about uh, the point Shad made where Renala's story was nowhere to be told. 
that he went and fought Rinala in Raya Lucara Academy and didn't understand her motivations or, or why she was even there. And Zio points out, if you had taken even the most uh, bare amount of time to go find the Church of Vows, which there is a way gate to on the way to Rinala in Raya Lucara Academy... There's a way gate that you'll find going through the academy when you're nearly to Renala, where if you take it, it teleports you to the Church of Vows. Teleports you there. And the NPC, the Church of Vows, will say, hey, welcome to the church. What do you know about it? And you'll be like, I don't know anything. What are you talking about? And they goes, oh, man, this church is all to, to tell you about the story of Renala and what happened to her. And I, I'm not going into detail specifically because this game has only been out a month. I'm not going into any fucking detail about that story. Mm. Go find it. Listen to it for yourselves. It's a fantastic and heartbreaking story. Um, but this NPC will literally give you the full backstory to Renala, and you can literally go to this NPC moments before you fight Renala. Not only that, if you didn't go to Raya Lucara Academy, uh, Raya Lucaria Academy uh, immediately, while you're exploring... The Church of Vows is hard to miss if you are on the east side of Lyurnia at any point. This is why I find it questionable that he was supposedly misinterpreting what Sh what Shad was saying. He he wasn't, but on he. Hand, on one hand, you have Sh you have Shad claiming that there is no room for the story to be told, and that is that is an extraordinary claim. And instead of, as I recall, instead of providing evidence, he just moves right along to the next point as if he, as if he had already, as if he had QED'd the whole thing. Uh, yeah, and then the, the passage that actually really ticks me off the most coming from Shad here. Um, you say the story of the game exists, but I did not give it enough respect to seek it out. No, the truth is this. The story of the game exists and is phenomenal, but the creators, and you, don't respect the story enough to present even the essentials to the player in such a way to make them want to know what happens. This is disrespectful to the story. If you loved the story so much, you might want people to more people to enjoy it, but you then defend the detrimental way it's presented and preventing so many people from enjoying it. That's a that's a lot of words to say no you. That's a lot of words to say no you. That's also a lot of words to backhand from Soft's writing team. The creators don't respect the story they fucking designed. Are you absolutely goddamn serious? That is as as the late as the late Christopher Hitchens once said, that which is presented that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and that which is presented without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. The yeah. I find I find his I, f I find the use of respect of respecting the story a bit amusing. Largely because, largely because he's not affording that same level of respect to Zylestorm in that case, or and or any but or anybody who is is countering what he's been say, what he's been saying. It, he's not respecting the fact that stories can be told in different in different methodologies especially when in a medium outside the written or spoken. It, it absolutely boggles me that this would be his response. It's extremely defensive when you get to the bottom there. You can tell he's, he's turtling up and poking out pokers. He's become a hedgehog. He's become a phalanx. Mm -hmm. And... In this case, Zio's right. It doesn't take a huge amount of going into every corner to find the story on Renala. Even if it did, even 
if I, as far as I'm concerned, the amount of effort required to get that story is irrelevant. <clears throat> he claimed that that there's no room for it to be told, and yet purposely omitted the means to tell it. All that would be needed to be dis to disprove what he said is to is to find that place. And yes, this is a this has been a game series from day one that has quadrupled down uh, at this point on encouraging people to explore and find things out for themselves. There, let's see. This concept was once called atmospheric storytelling, mm -hmm. where the atmosphere and settings you're in are telling the story as well. The You can literally go around all of the lands between in Elden Ring. Not fight a single story battle, but just go in between them, except for the mountaintop, because you actually have to go into Lane Dell to get the ability to go there. But the, the vast majority of the game, Limgrave, Kaelid, Liurnia, Mount Gelmir, and even the Altus Plateau. Mm -hmm. That's five of seven regions. And you can look. You, you don't even have to find items or lore entries or NPCs. You can look around and start to piece together what's been happening in this decaying land from the context clues alone. And something, I, something I really want to make clear is that this sort of storytelling is a storytelling that it is impossible, it is difficult if not impossible to tell in other mediums. It, it it is, I'd say it, I'd say it's damn near impossible to tell in books. Mm -hmm. It is not impossible to tell in film, but it's certainly difficult. Only because your your perspective in film is controlled. Mm -hmm. So if they want to make a point of these context clues about the decay, it has to go in shot somewhere in a way that doesn't make it easily missable, but also, if they don't want it to be too obvious, it has to be a little subdued. Mm. That's a balance that is... The only movies I c that come off the top of my head that I think of that actually told a story that way were actually the original Lord of the Rings trilogy movies with Peter Jackson. Their visual storytelling was really good. And even even within that, it there is a, there is a degree of bottlenecking that of has course. to happen because it's a film. Of course, video games don't have that constriction because you are you are the the primary vehicle for the story. Mm -hmm. Everything revolves around you, so you can choose how and where to look. Which ultimately ultimately makes his inability to understand the story a folly of his own doing. Yes, absolutely. That's not something that I say often. I don't like using the fr the whole you you misunderstood or so, or something like that because of how often it's used in bad faith. But this is where. The, but when you. But when the answer is. Is a, is a reflection of the kind of storytelling that it wants to tell, and you're intentionally not doing that. I have to question your well intent, mm -hmm. and what and whether or not you're whether or not you are approaching with a degree of confirmation bias, which I think in this particular situation. Shad was approaching with the massive amount of confirmation bias he has as a novelist. And if I know, I, I know I've remarked, I know I've made the joke over the years of a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. But that's only in the context of TTRPG. Mm -hmm. What I will, what I will say is that. Is that being is that being an is that approaching 
approaching a video game story as a novelist is a recipe for disaster because this isn't a novel. Even in, even in something a little bit more narrative, like, say, Knights of the Old Republic, this would still be a poor approach. Mm -hmm. The medium of video games is unique when it comes to entertainment media because of the interactive quality. Most media, most entertainment medium traditionally thought of as entertainment medium, because I will admit that there are entertainment media that are not traditionally thought that way. But if I break it down into, I'll call it the the big three. You've got literary media, so your your books, magazines, etc. Mm -hmm. Audiovisual media, and by this I mean radio, TV. And then video game media. And the reason it has to be separate from all the other audiovisual media is because of the interactive element. That interactive element, it's the only active entertainment media amongst these three in this triangle. Reading is passive. You pick it up, you read it, imagine it. The most active thing you do is turn the pages. Mm -hmm. Television, radio, Passive. You are sitting down and observing in whatever fashion you may be observing. It is only with, with video games that the media relies on your interaction to continue entertaining and to continue uh, progressing. Mm -hmm. If, if you, you can't turn on the video game and sit back unless it has like I don't know, an opening demo, but even then the opening demos loop and then you're bored after, you know, three demos go by. Mm -hmm. um, with Without interacting. It won't entertain you without you picking up the fucking controller, playing and progressing things. And because of that, the way stories can be told, vast, vast, vast different methods. And not all of them are going to be congruent to any other type of media. Some of you may recall that I've said in the past I don't respect art games as games. And it's for this reason that a lot of them don't take advantage of that interactive nature. They just have a passive story that they want to tell using a medium that is not suited for it. Art games honestly should have just been visual novels. <laughs> At least the, 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 that media would have been a little more suited for it. <laughs> you could have the same vistas you want people to see, and you could have the words on the screen that are like the notes you pick up or whatever, and still have them voiced. Although, oddly enough, in, the, in that particular case, they'd have to compete against actual visual novels, and they'd still lose. I mean, actual visual novels have compelling stories, though. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> a visual novel might be a novel... But it's still a more compelling story than an art game. Well, that and, that and at least visual novels can ha have some degree of input. But I'm getting but I'm getting on the rails. Mm -hmm. The res the response now, I'd like to point out that the response that Shad had to Z to Zile Storm was around ninety minutes. This is a separate response from what he typed up on on Zia Storm's comment section. Two days, two days after he posted his first "What I Don't Like About the World Building" video, and a day after uh, Zia Storm posted his response to Shad's video about what he doesn't like about world building. So again, the, a, a two day gap between these uh, these videos: two days, two days, two days, and then two days again. He posts a like. Like Monk said, a nearly 90 minute long video response to not just Zeostorm, but all detractors. And at this point, I was done. Like, I'm not even going to bother clicking play on that. I don't even bother clicking on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't. And I saw that Zeostorm also <laughs> did a watch through of it. Yeah, he did. He did a watch. He did a watch through, which that one I did catch, and he had said afterwards, 
I don't want I don't want to pursue this any further. I'm done I'm done after this. And he and he moved on to and he moved on to other material that w that was going to be a little more fulfilling than a, than an endless slap fight. Mm -hmm. Especially, but the but the and he wasn't and he was far nicer than I would have been. Far nicer than we've been this entire time. <laughs> but he had but he had there but there was one there was one thing that he. That he took that he took issue with that I think is a good crux with Zeo Storm's final response, and that was positioning it positioning his that Shad was positioning his points as if they are the absolute truth, which is why I opened this thing up with the mark of an expert passage. Because he is unwilling to admit he doesn't know enough, or doesn't, or what he doesn't know at all, in this situation. Mm -hmm. He insists that his knowledge is the only knowledge necessary to critique, and that any other other knowledge is simply opinion or misinformed. Yeah, which is, Eric you know. I mean, it is very arrogant and condescending and patronizing. But you know, Monk, I remember when I used to think that way. I was 13 and my balls had only dropped a couple years before. <laughs> and... A lot... I, um... I liken, I liken that particular attitude to an attitude that I see from... A lot of people who th a lot of people who think that th who think that they're making a better D and D, regardless of edition, because I saw I saw this I saw this going all the way back to the announcement of third edition, um, way back in t way back in two thousand, well, not the announcement but the release of the release thereof. Mm -hmm. Oh, the earliest exam one of the early examples being Castles and Crusades, and this idea of we're going we're going we're going to do things different and that'll and that'll make things that'll make things better because we because reasons but by different is better am i right guys but and this is this is something that i've this is something that i've warned designers of designers of all stripes but especially grogs that a good way a good way to kill off interest is by presenting yourself as the anti-example. When, when there were the whole debates about D and D fifth edition's politics, there were some people who were who were jump who were saying, "Well, screw screw this. I'm only I'm going to go right. I'm going to go back to A D and D and go and go with the OSR crowd." And I had and I had said to them that. Is going to set yourself up for disappointment because you're not approaching it in good faith. In that situation, it is less about the merits of what you're jumping onto has, and more about what it hasn't, which isn't sustainable. And. To bring this to bring this back to that to that kind to that kind of expertise thing, his uh, his appro his approach of of this of this is the this is the expertise thing, mm -hmm. and and pe and pe and other people are are misinformed. Is going to is going is always going to set is always going to be a setup for disappointment. Because of the fact that he it, that um there is not one there is not one way to do art. Mm -hmm. Not one way to do art, not one way to tell stories, not one way. Again, uh, to, while this is in a different context, all roads lead to Rome, but there's not only one road. That and um, for different roams, some roads are going to be bumpier than others. 
<laughs> Isn't that the truth? And just just because just because a different road might lead to Rome doesn't mean doesn't mean you're gonna get there at the same time. Yep. Now because of be because of the because of that if there if there's any pattern that I that I like to that I like to go into it's the it's the fact that the fact that not that knowledge without humility can create a degree of arrogance of this idea that you know, that you can, of utilizing that knowledge to believe that you believe that you know best because of because of that knowledge and this is the reason why argument from authority is considered a logical fallacy mm -hmm. by no means am i saying that he did that but he did veer very close and again i, I want to point out that well, we we both do respect Shad here. At least some of his work has been very uh, entertaining to watch, and the the insights he has has been very. Uh, I guess the best word would be insightful. <laughs> um, we also have to criticize what needs to be criticized, and in this case, what he did was very much worth criticism. I'd say it, I'd say it's very much a, I'd say it would fall under the category of conduct unbecoming. Yeah. And I try I try not to say that I try not to say that YouTubers should should put themselves on some higher standard like I'm one like I'm one of those people who yells about platforms. Look, the only time I'm going to yell about platforms is when I'm in a platforming game dying like say the messenger. Or a hat in time. Mhm. Mm But at but at the same t at the same time, the fa the fact of the matter is these a lot of the headaches that he that were that occurred in this week, this no good week that he ended up going through, could have easily could have easily been avoided if he just took the L. <laughs> yeah, if he just admitted he was wrong, mm -hmm. he would have been fine. And I'm pretty. I'm. I'm pretty sure. No, I'm pretty sure none of his followers would have viewed would have viewed him as weak on the matter. There's I don't think so. At least not not any of them that matter. I mean, there's get there's gonna be there's gonna be those who are gonna meme on the matter, but they were gonna do that regardless. So, whatever. Mm-hmm. But. The but if he if he had if he had done that or or just ha or just had some just had some ba just had some back and forth with a agree to disagree thing, he wouldn't have been in this situation. And I've I've seen some people try and turn this into a wider conversation of Elden of Elden Ring fans being too defensive slash toxic. First off. I think the term toxicity when it comes to fan communities is vastly, vastly overused. To the point that it's not even used as a descriptor anymore, it's used as a cudgel. Yep. And in the, pro and in the process ends up causing actual toxicity to get, uh, to get um, underreported. Just to, just to use an just to use an example. We um during during one of the, during one of the watch parties we did if we did about a week ago, I think I think we had a I remember we had a bit of a discussion on how the toxicity problem in certain mobas and certain hero shooters is self inflicted because of their design. Yeah. And at that at that same level. With the Souls games, these are ga these are games that are going to require a degree of a degree of attention and a, a degree of dedication. Mm -hmm. Miyazaki has gone on rec has gone on record for years that that it's more about persistence than difficulty. 
And because of that, there is going to be a degree of attachment and a, and a desire to see what what the attachment is be treat be treated in a fair light. So when people end up making arguments in bad faith or or, or arguments that have questionable logic, yeah, people are going to react a bit more viscerally. I am not de I'm not defending people who atta who attack um critics, but I'm also I'm also stating that you can't just kick a hornet's nest like that. Yeah. It, it, by by I think it, it part of it had to do with his tone and the assertion that he was correct and just went, you know, downhill from there. Mm -hmm. Cuz you'll note you'll notice that you don't see this kind you, you don't see this kind of attack if somebody says that they played Elden Ring and then decided that it wasn't for them. Mhm. Mm you re but if somebody if somebody plays or do or doesn't play and then demands an easy mode, yeah, that's going to cause a visceral response, especially since well, let's let's be honest. A lot of people who are um, demanding an easy mode, as I've pointed out in the past, aren't look never look at the bigger picture. Yeah. They also they also don't understand what it is they're actually asking for. Well, I a lot of the, a lot of times when it comes up, I I. I asked them, "Okay, how do you how how would you do an easy mode?" And the and the response I usually get is something about damage and health mitigation and or 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 taking away certain certain features. Mhm. Mm and I'm like, "Well, now you've just made it into a completely different game. It's not the same yep. game anymore with once you once you implement those changes or the in, or the intent is n is now changed, and I would also I would also note that when it comes to this accusation of of the, of Elden Ring players and just so and just Soulsborne players being too defensive, toxic, or what have you, it's always co it's always coming as a defensive remark. Yeah. Some someone has a bad take, they get BTFO'd on the matter, and then they claim um, toxicity, a la the boy who cried wolf. Even though they're technically being the ones being quote unquote toxic. Mm-hmm. But the the reason the reason I want to bring this up is that even though Zan and I are most certainly fans of the Souls series. Our critique of Shad, or our critique of certain journalists in the, in this regard, is not us being defensive about something that we like. I see no reason to defend to defend a lion in the cage. Just let him out of the cage. It is more a issue of the two of us do not like questionable argumentation. And bad logic. Yeah. And that's re that's really that's really where our that's really where our crux is. But we but it's not like we have this attitude of we're uh, we're never wrong. It's just well if you, if you want if you want to prove us wrong, you have to actually prove us wrong. Provide evidence. Mm -hmm. As a, uh, as a, uh, <laughs> as Monk pointed out earlier with Hitchens Razor, I, I like the um, the Latin proverb a, a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, Quod gratis assertor, gratis negator. Mm -hmm. What is freely asserted can be freely deserted. Yeah. Uh, if you have no proof, no evidence to counter the argument. And we have evidence. You can go watch these videos and play the game 
and go to these things that we pointed out and there's your evidence Mm -hmm. but if you have no evidence to counter us we're just going to sit here and go yeah and you're you're wasting our time go away yeah now i think the i look at the i look at the whole thing as a cautionary tale because whenever whenever one of these dramas comes comes to pass and i al- i always try and look at it as to and ask the question what can be learned from this whether whether it be drama with e celebs or or drama with um quote unquote experts i always try i always try and look at what the learning experience can be and in this case the learning experience is one is one that well, as a monk, I try I try and apply anyways, and that is humility. I know it's hard to believe that we're both humble, but uh, we're both willing to take our lumps and eat our crow if we have to. Mm-hmm. And well, I pr- I pretty much did that when I real when I realized that I had gotten my description of a certain mechanic wrong with the Power Rangers RPG review. Yeah, you you posted a uh, correction in the in the comments, you, and then you uh, stated that even with that correction, you still thought the mechanic was flawed. Mm-hmm. And I get, I don't consider that a I don't consider that a bit of backhanding because all the all that ha- all that happened was I mixed up was I mixed one point out of several. Hmm. And in the in this partic- in this particular case, the I'd say the other thing to to um, learn from this is that you is that you cannot you cannot apply a t- you cannot apply a template when you're ass- when you're assessing something. This is the reason why the scientific method has has that approach of what conclusions can we draw from what's present. And I know it might be a stretch to apply the scientific method to some to something like this, but I do think it has some some merit in this kind of situation. Mm-hmm. You look at what's present and see and see where it le- and see where it leads, versus um, having something in mind and trying to see and trying to see what supports it. Also known as the creationist method. Method in which the issue is that you are now in fully injecting confirmation bias into the entire experiment. Mm-hmm. And in his in his case, the the confirmation bias was approaching it from the framework of something familiar. Mm-hmm. When you're dealing with when you're dealing with a different medium. That's not that's not something you can utilize. It is it's, and ultimately, I'd I'd say the other lesson is, designed by designed by gospel, and and knowledge of designed by gospel can be blinding. Mm-hmm. If if applied incorrectly. But more but moreover. Um. Just understand that there. Just understand that there's a diff. That realism is not going to be as important as believability. <laughs> we want things to have a, a sense of authenticity, but they don't necessarily have to have a sense of verisimilitude. There is a difference in degrees. Mm-hmm. But I think I think we've belabored the point as as much as we can. Um. We will be we'll be back tomorrow night with the le- with the last class entry of Veil of the Vo- for Veil of the Void, and the one that we're gonna have to split into two parts. <laughs> uh, is it the last? Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's not the last Veil of the Void period, but it's the last one regarding classes. Oh, we didn't get the updated class. In time, Sag. No, that I have that in a separate document. But I'm saving that kind of thing for the end. Ah, okay. 
You know, one one little clean up before we do one thing of on the conclusions. Indeed. And of course, I'll ha I'll be having a few interviews um in the in the coming days, but that's a story for another day. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>